pediatric emergency medicine physician and an EMS medical director down from South Florida. And we're here to talk today about pediatric resuscitation and to discuss exactly what happens from the moment a child goes into cardiac arrest to the outcomes and why the outcomes today are a little different than what we would expect them to be. I want to start by showing you this slide. Uh, is there a way we can dim the, these front lights? All right, yeah. I'm showing you this road. This is a road in the middle of America. It's a very darkly lit road. And every year it turns out that there were 100 deaths on this road at nighttime. What do you think you would do if that, if you were the city manager, or if you were the engineer in this city, and you had 100 people dying on that road every year? What would you do? You you'd probably add lights. Right? You do something different. Well, it turns out that when, when you added lights to this dark road, you know what happened to the death rate? It went up. And why is that? How could it be that you have a problem, you find a solution to the problem, the death rate goes up? So it turns out that sometimes the problem that's in front of us, people are putting in solutions that may not actually work. So I want to describe what's been happening in the field of pediatric resuscitation. If you look at children since 1980 who have had a cardiac arrest out of hospital, until today, you could see that the survival hasn't changed at all. How could that be that here we are 30, 35 years later and not one, really, there's no uptick in the survival of a pediatric arrest patient in the hospital. You could see the red line making a bigger difference. And so that data that I just showed you comes from the American Heart Association's front page, right? This is this is right where you find that information, is that children, their survival statistics are very low. And if, if you're a provider or if you're a parent, the excuses are that children are different, things aren't, you know, uh, the paramedic wants to get the child to the hospital very quickly. All those are just excuses in my opinion. So I, want to sh I want to tell you a story about uh, a paramedic that I work with. Uh, I'm the medical director of Coral Springs Fire Rescue. Jonathan Robbins, when he was the first first month on the job, went to a two-year-old drowning. And they raced into the neighborhood, it was a gated community, and they got presented with a police officer, child basically dead in his arms. And Jonathan Robbins took the patient, and he ran to the back of the rescue, and the officer said, Robbins, you're a rookie, you drive. And so Robbins got in the vehicle, and he drove away with a child. They hadn't started care. They haven't done chest, chest compressions. They haven't given epinephrine. Why is it that he wanted to do that? Why is it that today in this town, when a child would have a cardiac arrest, the paramedics who show up want to take the child and run? If it's an adult, any one of us, let's say I fell over right here, they would resuscitate me right here. So why the difference between how we treat kids and how we treat adults? And so Robbins couldn't get out of the neighborhood. He made a right and a right dead end. He passed the house again. The parents were looking him right in the eyes. He passed the house a second time until he finally got out. The child never made it. And for eight years, he never told anybody. He was depressed. He had severe anxiety. And so that's not just his story. It's, it's a lot of stories from the pre-hospital environment and from the hospital environment. So I'll tell you what happened to him at the very end of this. So whether you're in medicine or not in medicine, look at this case. You have a five-year-old difficulty breathing, is at a restaurant, and suddenly the child goes into anaphylaxis, and now you have six minutes to arrive on scene. Now, if you're in healthcare and, and you actually may even consider doing this, most of you, once you see that, you get anxious right when you saw it. But if you provide care for, for adults, and I change that to 65-year-old, many of you would say, ah, oh, that's easy, no problem. So it's that, it's that divergence that I want to talk about today. And then when you get to the scene, let's go back to the five-year-old, and you have the scene and the child who looks like that, now try to provide care when you're anxious in front of mom and dad, and you're trying to figure out a little minuscule dose. And then we start to wonder why this is so difficult. So I want to take you kind of into your brain a little bit to explain why this is indeed very difficult. Uh, many of you have probably seen and read Dr. Kahneman's book, uh, it's really an, an epic book, really, on, on how your brain is hardwired. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you right now that I'm going to show you some slides, and you're going to make mistakes. 
You have no choice but to make mistakes on what I'm going to show you because your brain is hardwired to make those mistakes. And perhaps it's that hardwiring that we have to address in order not to make mistakes in pediatrics. Let's talk about that. Kahneman describes as a fast part of your brain, he calls it system one thinking, and a slow part of your brain. So system one, if I told you not to answer this question, don't answer this, one plus one, too late you answered it, right? Because your system one is that fast, it's very arrogant, and you need that in, in your day-to-day -day life, and a lot of us in emergency medicine need that as well. System two is very slow, sleeping, doesn't want to be woken up, and we'll show you how this plays into pediatric decision making in a second. So, You've probably seen this before, but if you haven't, your brain thinks the top line is longer, and we know that they're both the same length, but your system one can learn that and say, you know what, I'll never make that mistake again. So that's, system one is fast, it can make mistakes, but it can fix itself. As you're looking at the screen, without even me asking you the question, your system one told you that the two children on the outside were sick and the child in the middle was well. Didn't have to ask the question, it just came to you. That's system one. It's very good at rapid assessment. If you haven't seen this question, take a second to answer it. And so most people say one of each kind or two, right? But it, the real answer is zero. It wasn't Moses. Right, okay. System one is arrogant, it's fast, and it will make mistakes if you let it make mistakes. So that, that, I didn't make that one up. That's Kahneman made that one up. Uh, it's, it's, it's epic, this thing. Okay. Which table is longer, which table is wider? If you've seen it before, you know they're both the same length and width. Don't believe it? Go Google it, take a measuring tape and measure it out yourself. System one wants to think something that's not there, it's an optical illusion. If you had to vote for one of these four gentlemen for the next president of the United States, who would you vote for? They did a study, 80% picked that guy. So your system one is making decisions for you, it's reacting right away, and that's just how it goes. That's system one. Why we make mistakes in medicine is because your system one sees that and it just picks the wrong vial. Vasopressin versus Zofran. Oxytocin versus metoclopramide. Here's a boy who got his antibiotic dose in the OR and stopped breathing because he got a paralytic instead of his antibiotic. These are mistakes your system one is going to make if you let it. So this is my favorite one. I've just been doing this for a little while. I'm going to show you about eight numbers. You have to add them up. You have a second and a half between each number. They're easy numbers. I want to see how many of you get the number right. This is what happens in the back of an ambulance. It happens in my emergency department. When someone thinks they're, they're doing the right calculation and they're confident that they got it right, and at the end of the day, they had no idea that they made the, the, that they made the mistake. So here we go. Answers? 6,000. Does anyone else say something besides 6,000? Nobody? Boom! You're the only guy who got it right, unless, unless that's what you were saying. Okay. Most people say 6,000. Almost everybody. Very few people who know the answer. And here's why. So add this up again, folks, and look what your brain got you to do wrong. You took the tens, and you made them hundreds, and you made it a 1,000 and you add it up to 6,000. If I would have shown it to you again, you would have made the same mistake again. This, you cannot help. This is why math should never be done in an emergency department. Math should never be done in the back of an ambulance, and today, it's being done on every single case. Okay, system one error right here. Uh, okay, so here's system two. So let's see if the same guy gets it right. So now, I'm gonna give you a real system two question, and answer it really quickly, and go. Right, so the people are trying to do it, your eyes are going up and to the right. Turns out that system two, if you're trying to do this, most people don't even try to do it, they're just going to wait, oh, he'll, he'll just give me the answer type of thing. Um, your, your eyes will dilate, your heart rate goes up, you start breathing a little faster. So you're physiologically different in system two, that's a very interesting point. For those of you who are into stroke, the NIH stroke scale is a system two thing, you can't determine someone's stroke severity until you actually sit there and actually focus on it. System two is not easy to do. If you're in medicine, you work in a hospital, I'm the doctor, I say, here's a two-year-old who has low blood pressure, is about to die, and then I say the following. I would like to have a central line, please. Someone get me a norepidrip. 
let's intubate, let's put a Foley in an NG tube. I challenge everybody in this room, go into your local hospital and ask for those things for that two-year-old, and you'll wait, and you'll wait, and you'll wait. And no one will ever give you the correct answer until they go figure it out and find it out. But we don't have time to wait. This is system two. Turns out that system two has a problem, right? Because if you have people asking you dosages in a code during resuscitation, you're doing calculations, drawing up medications, your gas tank goes to empty, and Kahneman will tell you when your system two gas tank gets activated and goes to empty, we do this. So that was me for a, lo for a big part of my career. That's paramedics, Jonathan Robbins, who left the scene. System two goes up and he just takes a kid and runs, and then we just haul butt to the hospital when system two gets activated. And so it turns out there's a very big dichotomy today in America, in the world. When I say adult arrest, the paramedic or doctor feels like Superman, Superwoman. When I say pediatric arrest, you feel exactly the opposite, and you feel like this. And so it turns out that it's, it's not just another course, another class, you're not good at math, it's got nothing to do with that. It's a psychological issue, system one and system two. Sorry for that part of it, but you have a 60-year-old male who has a low blood sugar, has no heart rate or is having allergic reaction, if I ask you for the dosages of those medications and you're a healthcare provider, the answers are it's a whole thing, a whole thing, and a whole thing. That's the dose for adults, right? I see some people nodding their heads. So now if, I, if, the, if the same exact thing happened to a five-year-old, five-year-old, same exact thing, give me the dose as a volume. There's nobody in here who can do that. And, 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 I'll, and I'll, tell you, I'll tell you that if, if you haven't seen what is done currently, What's been done for the last 30 years is basically you, you're supposed to get to the scene or in the ER, you're supposed to measure the kid, you're supposed to get to the tape, and then it makes you do another math calculation here. Th this is what we use today in America, okay, for our children who are dying uh, or, or, or who are critically ill. This is all system two. This is the secret, folks. System two is all through pediatric treatment, and you should never let someone do a math equation ever again. So to review, system one is fast, makes mistakes. System two, great information resource, but you really don't want it during a critically ill uh, environment. Now I'm gonna make you even more upset. So these are three bread and butter cases, anaphylaxis, femur fracture, and seizure. And these are the bread and butter medications that we all should know if, if, if we work in the field. But let me show you what the tape I just showed you has for these three types of, of children. Epinephrine, 1 to 1,000, fentanyl, and midazolam. So as a medical director, I have a set of protocols. My protocols say for this, you give this. For pain, you give fentanyl, and for seizure, you give midazolam. But my medics were also told to carry this. But the dosages for these three medications are nowhere near my protocol. So basically, all across the country today, people are using a tool that was developed many, many years ago that has information that has nothing to do with anything we're supposed to give our children. And so this, I only learned as, after I became a medical director. By the way, the top children's hospitals in the country don't use this thing. The pediatric emergency medicine folks don't use it, but everybody else is supposed to use it. It's, it's decades old. So I did a study looking at age, 38 agencies across the country, and I compared their protocols to this tape, 49% discordance across the board. Some, some had a 63% discordance. Okay. In this county that we're sitting in today, this paper just came out a few, months, a few weeks ago. Uh, Costa, Contra Costa County and Alameda County. 240,000 EMS patients, 100 kids in anaphylaxis. Epinephrine was withheld 45 times, and if it was given, EMS only gave it six times because the dose for the epi is not on the tape. There's no Benadryl, there's no Cyamedrol on the tape. And so we're withholding medications on kids who are in are what we call circling the drain. This just came out. And who do they blame? They blame the paramedic. They shouldn't blame the paramedic. It's not the paramedic's problem. It's the system's problem. Only 11% of those kids got a life-saving drug in this county where we're sitting today. And it's a very high-functioning group of people, by the way. I know them. So how do we transform our folks from being scared to actually being qualified to do this for pediatric patients? We have to remove system two. That's what we have to do. And that's what we've done. And so. What I'm gonna show you now is what we've done over the last six years, it's, it's my mission in life, is to change all of this by human factors engineering, customizing the dosing for each ambulance and each hospital, 
we train them specifically, and then we're looking at outcomes. So let me show you what we've done. And again, this is a, uh, the New Orleans EMS uses our system, and you can see there's a customized book, and all the drugs now that they carry, and the concentrations they carry, and the dosing they, their medical director wants, and then the volumes are all listed for them here on paper, and I'll show you we have an application now that we just launched. Here's a paper that compared the, our system to the current system, the, the, the standard of care, and we, we found a, I wasn't involved in the study, they found a three-fold difference in error rate compared one to the other. Um, and then I want to now go into, or just you know, kind of to finish, to finish the, the, the concept of um, many agencies, we're in 38 states, they've been using our, our system. Miami-Dade's been one of the, the, the longest users, because that's where I'm from. Um, Alejandro fell into this pool, the two-year-old fell into a pool, and we teach how to be confident, comfortable when you get into the scene and actually treat the child on scene. And Tammy, knew, uh, uh, um, Tammy Napoles was a lieutenant, and they used our system. They stayed on scene. This kid was in cardiac arrest. He was underneath for six minutes. They stayed on scene. They didn't run. They got the kid back on scene. And let's take a look at the outcome. So there's Alejandro. He was, you know, they put him on the news. He was um, in a coma for nine days, intubated, you can see. And then he woke up again, and he learned how to walk again. He learned how to say mommy again. And the credit goes to Tammy and her partner who said, you know what, we're not going to run like we used to. We're actually going to stay, and they did. And here's a little video. System has built my oh, sorry, I wasn't supposed to have the, the audio in there, but that, there, there's Alejandro. And so he's, he's his normal kid again, and, and she gets all the credit on that. Let me take you back to Robin. So when I became their medical director in 2015, we said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to change everything and teach the system. He was sitting in the front row, and I didn't know why he was sitting in the front row. It's because of all the angst he had for the eight years. And he was making it a commitment to actually get better. And so after the meeting, when I met him for the first time, we shook hands. He said, Doc, I hope I never have to use this. I said, I hope so either. I hope so too. And so basically, a week later, he gets this case, 18-month-old girl. And guess what he showed when he shows up on scene? Police officer with 18-month-old girl dead in his arms. This time, as Robin says, put her right down. Girl had bleeding from the mom doing blind finger sweeps. He suctioned it out. He put the blade in. He takes the McGill, which is a little forcep. He took out the grape. Girl comes back to life, walks out a day and a half later. We wrote him up for that. Then, another week later, he gets another call, another two-year-old drowning. And this, and this time, he treats the kid on scene at the poolside, gets a heart rate back. This kid goes home alive and is with family today. And so he came out, he, he found me months later, and he says, by the way, Doc, I've got to tell you something. I've never told this to anybody, but this has basically got me out of a severe depression I've been in for the last eight years of my life. And the thing is, it's not just him. It was, it was me for many years. It's every provider who hears pediatrics, they get panicked because the system we've given them doesn't work. And that's just how it goes. So here's more data. Denver uh, Health has been using our system for about eight months now. Look at the increase in fentanyl use for pain and Versed use for seizures. Um, it's a significant number. They're putting out an abstract now showing that a four times higher rate of fentanyl is being used in children under the age of six. And that's going to be put out this January. This is the, this is the slide that um, I'm, mo I'm really most impressed with and I'm most proud of. Polk County is a big county in Florida that's been using our system since January 2014. They have mainly drowning. So they had 20 arrests, 18, 21, 35, and 27 arrests in those years. And this is, this is still year to date. They got pulses back on only 0% and 11%. None of them walked out of the hospital. Ever since they started using our system, which is not a new way of doing medicine. It's just stay and treat the kid on scene, taking away system two. 33% uh, got pulses back. And of the 33, 71% walked out of the hospital. That was five children. 70%. Uh, of those 29, that was seven children, and now here, this year alone, 13 kids have walked out of the hospital neurologically intact, all because we're treating them the same, we're giving them the honor that they respect, uh, that they deserve, and we're giving the parents their children back, which is really an important thing for me as well. Um, so I'm not going to harp on this for too long because, I, I, again, I think that we're trying to integrate technology in a way that actually people will use it and not just to give it to them. But now we have that same information in that book with a touch of a button. It goes right into their EPCR or their EMR. 
And so we're really excited about um, what the future holds with uh, the technology. But that really is not the basis of what we do, but this is something that um, we're really excited uh, about the future. One slide about the company. Uh, I, I really can't take much of the credit here. My wife, uh, Allison, uh, leads the team. We have uh, uh, nine folks who work with us. Um, and we're in 38 states. The Cleveland Clinic in Ohio just converted all 15 of their hospitals over to our system. Uh, Denver Health, all the Disney Cruise Lines and so forth. So we are, we are uh, we're, we're excited, we're humbled, um, and, and when we hope that uh, when they put us six feet under the ground that people say that we have made a difference and that's really what we're trying to do. And so what I, what I, I challenge you all in the room is when you see a problem, Perhaps it's not putting a light. Perhaps it's not putting a guardrail. Perhaps we just take a tractor and just get rid of the whole damn road and rebuild it again. And I can tell you that someone who has been fighting this battle for six years, that the people up at the top don't like someone like me who's challenging, but I'm standing tall now because we have the data and we're making a difference. Here's my information. Uh, please contact me or talk to me afterwards. And I thank you guys for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm not sure if there's time for questions, but maybe, maybe, oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, would, I would disagree with you. So in other words, I, if, I'm, if I'm the medical director and I'm following the evidence, the standard of care is something that they, you, you would entrust the medical director to provide. So if, if the medical director is not doing their job, I mean, remember the, the AHA, their guidelines, we have to work within those guidelines. Our company, when we have an agency in Iowa who asks us to customize and the information is wrong, we fix it. And we, we tell them, you need to fix this. We're not putting it in here. So we're, we're another layer of that. But right, every doctor in here will intubate people differently with different regimen of drugs. It's all different. And so that difference makes it even harder to treat patients. So it's a little easier in EMS because we have protocols. But I will tell you that there's not one customization that goes out of our, out of our office that is not standard of care. And if there's anything that's incorrect, it just doesn't go out. We don't allow it. Sure. This all, well, no, but I, I, I talk, I'll talk to you offline about it. This all comes from the, from PALS, American Heart Association gui guidelines. None, none of these things are, are like, you know, on the fringe. These are all just, it's standard stuff. It, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not something that someone just putting in a medication just for the fun of it. It's all, it's pretty routine stuff. It's just that the dosing and the volumes are very hard to calculate when you're trying to do it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I'm, I'll challenge you on that too. That Polk County data is being published and all, every single type of arrest, whether it be an under a year of age, will it be over, whether it's, they're, they're mainly drownings, but those are survivors, neurologically intact. I mean, th those numbers are going to be, I think that paper is going to be a landmark change because everyone has thought for years that it, it's going to flatline, and I just think that's BS. I just, I don't, I don't believe it. Um, I think we have the data to prove it. At my own agencies, our ROSC rate is 84%. 84% ROSC rate. Now, our survival is not as good as, as their survival in Polk County, but we're proving now that staying on scene and actually doing it on scene is actually those first few minutes are the most critical minutes. And I think that that's a, that's a very critical thing. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna prove the world wrong on this with data. So it's not gonna, you're not gonna hear it from me, you're gonna hear it from the people who are doing it and are, are being rigorous about their research. So. No, we're, we're, we're in 38 states, uh, you know, we're in Bend, Oregon. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we, I think that as, if you're trying to do what I'm doing, which is go against the institution of medicine and do something different, very different, then uh, there, there, it's a hurdle. So if I'm speaking to a doctor who's my colleague and I say I'm doing something different than you've been taught, the, the red flags go up and they say I want to see the data, I don't believe anything you're doing, and we, we, we're fighting through all that to get people like the Cleveland Clinic. And, and, and so I can write a book on trying to do something that's very different that has data, it's data driven, it's amazing what doctors will do to their own people. So, uh, but I, I, I appreciate that question. It, it's, it's been a fascinating ride. So I'll, I'll stop and I'd love to hear, hear more commentary afterwards. I wanna leave time for, for my colleagues to, to speak. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.